Billions of people around the world depend on forests for survival. But right now, our forests are changing quickly. An ever-increasing number of non-native species threaten to take over forests, and in the process, reduce the resources that humans have relied on for centuries. Lots of species are going extinct as a direct result of competition, predation, catching diseases from exotic species. They disrupt food chains. They prevent um, proper water uh, filtration through particular areas. They can harm uh, water intakes on dams, things like that. So there's direct economic impacts estimated in the billions annually in just the U.S. alone. And so it influences the things you see around you, the ecology around you. It also influences your pocketbook. To study this changing environment, John Parker is looking to the forest floor and monitoring which tree and plant seedlings are sprouting and which are thriving to adulthood. So here we have a young native plant, spice bush, and a young invasive or non-native plant, Japanese barberry. And so one of the questions that we're looking at is if we had two of these things growing right next to each other like we do, who wins and why? In a battle between species, one native, one invasive, which species will survive? The answer will help us understand if forests will continue to function in the same way, providing resources for billions of people around the world. So one of the things that we hope by studying these interactions among species, so the growth of this species versus the growth of this species, is we can predict where the forest is going to be in the future. If non-native species win out, we could have a forest that looks dramatically different than we do now. And lots of things depend on native species for food and habitat. So we could have a forest that's relatively rich in non-native species. You could end up with fewer insects, fewer native mammals, fewer important biological interactions that we need in our native forests. In order to uncover the keys to plant survival, Parker and his team of researchers and volunteers are studying small segments of the forest and monitoring how they grow. The volunteers include members of the HSBC Corporation, who take a week away from work to learn about forests and environmental science. It's inside, but then look at the... Mm -hmm. This is also the a roots vine. Are out, eh? Yeah. This is a honeysuckle, oh. Japanese honey. It's actually an invasive plant. So Parker and his team set up plots that test different variables. In the plots, the team measures and tags every tree and plant seedling. 115.3. 15.3. That's substantially larger as well. The seedlings are what we call the future of the forest. And so this little guy right here is a baby tulip poplar tree. This is going to eventually grow up to be like one of these tall trees that you see in the background. And the question that we're trying to figure out here is, are the teenagers, are the replacement for these big trees, the same species at the same abundance as the canopy as the forest looks now, or are we going to have a different forest in about a hundred years from now? What's the future of our forest going to look like? The team compares plots in logged and unlogged forests to see how forest canopy can affect growth on the ground. With more sunlight available, the team finds that invasive species can grow much faster in the logged area. So right now we're in the logged area. As you can see, there's less of a canopy here. There's a lot more light that can get through. And obviously, things grow a lot better here. In one part of the logged forest, an invasive plant species has completely taken over. So one of the things that we're interested in is how this big carpet, this monoculture of non-native species is influencing the native species, particularly the native trees that we want to recruit into this recovering forest. And if you peel back this area right here, you essentially see no native trees coming through this, this dense layer of non-native vegetation. Um, and we think that's probably just because there's simply no space, no light left, no resources left for native species to get through in this area. Herbivores are another factor that can affect the battle between native and invasive plants. Deer, for example, may prefer to eat native over non-native plants. So what we have here 
is a deer exclusion cage. So three years ago we put up fences. We have 32 of these fences. And what we're doing is we're creating a world without deer. So this gives a forest an opportunity to grow with nothing being eaten by deer. And so we're comparing that to areas outside that are not fenced. And so here we have no deer and then areas with deer. If deer do prefer to eat native plants, then invasive plants have an advantage. Right now, it looks like deer have a negative impact on native species. They do suppress native species. But we're not seeing a real impact on the non-native species, at least after three years. Studying plants in deer exclusion cages does not tell the whole story. Some plant species can protect themselves from the insects and animals that like to eat them. Because this affects what plants will survive to adulthood, Parker and his team have to test plants for their physical and chemical defenses. Here we have spice bush again. And one of the reasons they call it spice bush is if you crush the leaf, I'm gonna smell it now. When you smell it, it smells like lemon. So it makes a chemical compound that keeps herbivores from eating it. Lots of plants do that. Coffee plants make caffeine, tobacco plants make nicotine. Right, so plants can be chemically defended against the herbivores that eat them. Now another way of defending yourself is what this non-native species does, Japanese barberry, it has all of these sharp spines. This is called a physical defense against herbivores. The team tests for these natural defenses back in the lab. Some plants have physical protective traits. The holly leaf, for example, has spikes and is very tough. This is a holly leaf, Ilex opaca, and we are putting it into the penetrometer machine. This machine's gonna go down and punch a smooth hole into it and measure how much newtons of pressure it takes to punch a hole in it. And the reason that's important is because that uh, caterpillars and grasshoppers all have a certain amount of pressure they can exert with their mouth. So if they can't exert enough pressure to bite through a leaf, they're not gonna want to eat that as much. Oak leaves have another physical protection. They are covered in tiny hairs that provide a barrier between a hungry herbivore and the juicy leaf. It looks like a glass field with just little spikes everywhere. And that's what the uh, caterpillars or other insects have to chomp through in order to get to the leaf, the part that they actually want. So it sounds like a lot of work. What feels like fuzz to us is very sharp and very impenetrable to uh, herbivore. The team also breaks down leaves in order to measure their chemical components. Now you've got a freshly ground leaf, and you can smell that this is a very pungent, aromatic plant. Those are all those chemical defenses that are coming out right now. The team extracts the plant essence out of the leaf and feeds it to herbivores. And what we'll be left with is something that looks like this, a dry jar, full of all the essential oils, all the primary metabolites, all the secondary metabolites, all the essence of the plant. We can take this food, we can coat it onto something that we know an herbivore would typically eat, a control food. If they don't eat it when the addition of these plant chemical metabolites, then we can assume that that plant was probably chemically defended. Testing the chemical and physical defenses of plants will provide Parker's team with more information about which plants will survive to adulthood. So all of that's microstegia in the non-native grass. By compiling the data from this and his other experiments, Parker and his team can begin to construct a model of a future forest. If we lose most of these native species, which we won't, but we'll lose some of them, if we lose them and they're more or less functionally replaced by non-native species, what is that forest gonna do? How's it gonna act? Will it support the same number of native birds, mammals, insects? Do you get the same biological diversity in a non-native forest versus a native forest? Or are they totally different? Parker and his team will continue to monitor the battle between native and non-native plants to predict the fate of our forests.